I want to start with a little story from my life. Uh, the story is set in 2012, uh, or more precisely, in April of 2012. Uh, now, 2012 was a little bit weird. Uh, at the time, the world was a very different place uh, compared to right now. Um, among uh, smartphones, iPhones had a majority market share, kind of unthinkable today. Uh, there was a cloud platform called Eucalyptus that somehow was still a thing. Uh, and there was a distributed storage platform that was called Ceph, and that was new that nobody knew about, all of which is, is, is kind of unthinkable um, at the time. Um, um, or right now, actually. And um, I, at the time, was in San Francisco. Uh, April uh, 2012 in San Francisco, we had the Folsom Design Summit. It was the first OpenStack summit that I attended. Uh, who here in this room was at the Folsom Summit in San Francisco? Could you raise your hands, please? Okay, great. Leave your hands up, please. Everyone else, look around. The people with the hands up now, old people. <laughs> so I was, I was in San Francisco along with a handful of, the, of, of people in the, in, the, in the back of the room. And uh, at the time, we were having our first um, summit sessions where we were actually talking about high availability. Uh, and at the time, I was very confused. So I ran uh, a, a main conference talk session, and I ran a design summit session in which we discussed what OpenStack needed in terms of, um, of high availability. Um, and, uh, and I thought this was going to be relatively smooth sailing. So we're going to, OK, so OpenStack didn't have any high availability features, or not many at the time. So uh, we were going to discuss this, and we're going to com come up with a plan, and wonderful. And here I was, very, very confused, because as it turned out, I was essentially having to argue the merits of high availability uh, to a group of uh, OpenStack developers, or, or basically sort of the best and brightest cloud developers in the world. So we were actually arguing over whether or not OpenStack needed high availability in the first place. And um, there was sort of an opposing argument, and the opposing argument was along the lines of, well, um, actually, that's not the cloud infrastructure's job to do. Rather, it's the application developer's job to do. So they have to figure out how to make their application in such a way that they can essentially deal with the failure of any uh, component of your cloud at any given time, and everything should still be happy and wonderful. And then the discussion sort of emerged to the point where um, we got to, well, actually, you know, making the cloud infrastructure really, really highly available and resilient and whatnot um, is, is, is actually a real challenge. So basically, the main opposing argument to why OpenStack needed high availability or not at the time was, it's hard. And then I was a little like this. <laughs> um, and as it turned out, luckily, the majority of the uh, developers in the room were like this as well. It's like, oh my god, we, no, we can't argue about this. We actually need to make this happen um, because it's ultimately what people need and what people want. And the, I will mention that sort of the original discrepancy there was there's, there's two ways that you can look at uh, a cloud platform or two motivations from which you can approach a cloud platform. One is you're essentially building uh, you know, uh, the next uh, Twitter or Etsy or, or whatever you would like. Any kind of application needs to scale massively and whatnot, but which over which you, and this is important, have full engineering control. That is to say that if you need to um, meet you know, a different kind of availability requirements or, or, or different performance indicators or whatnot, then you have an engineering team that can do this. The other approach that you can employ uh, a cloud platform from is essentially re-architecting your data center along cloud lines. And this is classically what we do in, in private cloud. And there, the situation is quite different, which is you have dozens or maybe even hundreds of applications that you need to maintain. Uh, and you don't have full engineering control over this. Good luck rewriting SAP on your own if you, if you figure out that it doesn't match you know, your, 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 your cloud platform. So, um, so we quickly realized that something had to be done here. And, uh, and thankfully, things happened. Things actually did happen. So um, we are uh, in a much, much improved state here now. Things have truly changed for the better uh, in OpenStack. And so let's forward to today. And uh, who, who, who in here has children and occasionally takes them on road trips? I'm, I'm sure the old people that raised their hands earlier did. OK, and there, there's, more, there's more of those. So whenever you take your kids on a road trip, you, like 20 minutes after departure, you get the question, are we there yet? 
you know? And that is the, that is the thing that I want to, want to ask, that's a, the question that I, I, I want to posit here for, uh, for OpenStack, uh, high availability today. And it actually looks pretty good as, as of this point. So what do we need for building a highly available OpenStack cloud? Um, let's start with sort of the, 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 the minimum viable OpenStack deployment that you could possibly consider. And by viable, I mean that yes, of course, we all know we can deploy DevStack onto a single node and we can essentially have a one node OpenStack uh, environment, but that's not really a viable, uh, a viable cloud. Um, the minimum simple uh, viable cloud looks roughly kind of sort of like this. Okay, you have an API node or endpoint node that your API requests that your, that your clients uh, use uh, or that your clients issue come in on. Uh, and this API or endpoint node will typically also run your OpenStack dashboard. Uh, the incoming requests that we get then get handed off to what we call a controller node. Uh, and that controller node then decides, for example, uh, scheduling and uh, creates uh, and uh, uh, hands off to, for example, Neutron to create your virtual networks and so forth. And then ultimately, uh, you're firing up a virtual machine and that virtual machine runs on one of your compute nodes, your hypervisor nodes. And in a minimum viable deployment, that would be like a typically small number. It could be a single compute node. It could be two, three, four, something like that. And then you also have a separate network node, and that's the thing that takes care of both your east-west routing, that is to say the routing between uh, individual tenant networks inside your cloud, and also the north-south routing, which is the routing between your tenant networks and the outside world, such as the internet. And the reason why I've colored all of this in, in, in different colors is that these node types have very, very different uh, high availability requirements that we need to consider. Um, so ideally, what we want to do, of course, is from this very, very simple minimum viable cloud, uh, we want to sort of eliminate all the single points of failure and all the bottlenecks that we have in there. And yes, they are inherent in this kind of setup. So ideally, what we want to do is we want to get from this to this. We, want, we typically want uh, any number of API nodes, so we need more than one uh, in order to achieve you know, some degree of high availability, and then we typically need more uh, if we're actually bottlenecking sort of uh, our, 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 API, uh, our API calls. Um, we, need, we definitely need more than one control node, because if we don't have a Nova scheduler, for example, then we're not going to be able to schedule any new VMs. Uh, if we don't have a Neutron server um, or, um, uh, or, or, or Cinder volume or, or, or Cinder scheduler, for that matter, then we're not going to be able to create networks or, uh, or persistent volumes and so forth. Um, then we, of course, want as many workhorses as we can possibly get. So compute nodes, maybe dozens, maybe hundreds, who knows. And then also for the network nodes, uh, we want them to be highly available, which means we definitely need more than one. And we also, since they actually handle most of the north-south traffic and also a fair amount of the traffic that is inside our cloud, namely the one that goes from one virtual network to another virtual network, um, we also want those to be highly available because without them, we don't have any network connectivity at all. And because they're also, they tend to be sort of a scalability bottleneck, we also want several of them. So we want to get from uh, a single, uh, a minimum viable deployment to one that we can actually call um, highly available. And that would be sort of a wonderful thing to have. Now, as I said, all of these have sort of different considerations that apply to them. These node types are different considerations that apply to them in terms of high availability. Now, for the API nodes, it's actually relatively simple. Uh, we always need one, at least one. Um, so um, we have to have more than one node that actually runs these services. The services themselves are actually inherently stateless. So the only thing that we really need to care about is we need to have multiple instances of these services and we need to make them available or, or uh, accessible somewhere uh, on an IP, uh, TCP IP basis uh, from the outside. That's essentially what we need to do. And so therefore for the API nodes, it's a relatively simple challenge to make those highly available. For the controller nodes, things look a bit different. Uh, there are some services still that we have where, uh, we, where, it, where we really only want one of them active at any given time. That doesn't necessarily mean that only one of them, uh, only one instance of, say, for example, Cinder Scheduler or Nova, Nova Scheduler can run. Um, but for, like I said, for some of these services, it's good if only one of them is active at any given point, which means that, for example, we redirect uh, everyone uh, to one of those instances that sit behind a load balancer for example. Then we have our compute nodes. Of those, of course, we have 
many, many, many. Um, they have their own uh, uh, availability requirements. Uh, whether or not they are stateful or not depends largely on how we have configured our, our virtual machines and also how we've configured our uh, block storage backends. And then we have our network nodes. Now, these are really pretty tr tricky because we always want at least one of them because without one, none of our uh, VMs, none of our guests actually have any outside connectivity and none of them also have any connectivity to any other VM in the same cloud on a same tenant network. But here, we also want uh, these basically to bear the brunt of the incoming and outgoing network traffic. So it actually happens fairly quickly uh, as we scale a cloud that um, these hit their, their scalability and their <laughs> throughput limits. So here, uh, we really want not only active-passive high availability, but also active-active high availability. And then there's another set of nodes, and that other set of nodes are, uh, are the nodes that run services that are absolutely crucial and critical to OpenStack, but are not part of OpenStack as in the OpenStack code base proper. And these we call infrastructure nodes, um, such as, uh, for example, that would be the node that runs our relational database management system or the, um, the node that runs our message queuing server. Um, and these, again, have different uh, HA requirements uh, depending on which service we're talking about. Uh, regarding whether uh, we only want a service to be available at any given time and not have to worry about replication, uh, or we actually, or the service is actually stateful, and uh, and we we do have to worry about making the data available, which usually means we need some form of replication. Okay, so what are the conventions and best practices that have emerged over these about two and a half years? And actually, there's a lot of work uh, and and very exciting work that has been happening here between the ice house and Juno releases. Um, what are these conventions, these best practices uh, that have emerged for building highly available OpenStack clouds? And it's actually very encouraging to see a fair amount of convergence between vendors, which is sort of a healthy departure of the wheel reinvention and NIH that we frequently see in, in well, I was about to say other projects, but in fact, we're guilty of that ourselves as well. Um, but in the HA world, it's actually pretty nice to see this convergence. So well, let's talk about uh, the infrastructure uh, first. And I want to get started with uh, the high availability uh, that we build for our relational database management services. Now, as you're all aware, uh, pretty much every single OpenStack service in some shape or form puts some data into a relational database management backend. Um, and uh, there are several of those backends that are supported. Most vendors have essentially uh, standardized on uh, MySQL uh, as, their, uh, as their relational uh, database uh, backend. Uh, and when we're talking about how to make the, this data highly available, then all major vendors, with one exception, have standardized on uh, Galera, which is a synchronous multi-master replication facility based on write set replication for MySQL. Um, and, uh, and this is, of course, this is pretty challenging to get right in the sense that uh, this is a service where we absolutely need at least one instance available because every other OpenStack service depends on a relational database. Um, but this service, the database service, is of course entirely stateful and we need to make sure that if we have several instances of those, then their data is in sync, their data is available uh, to each other and the preferred way of doing that in the MySQL, uh, in the MySQL context for OpenStack happens to be Galera. For RabbitMQ high availability, and again, pretty much all the vendors have now standardized on RabbitMQ as their, as their messaging bus. For RabbitMQ high availability, um, that's a little uh, more complex uh, in the sense that most OpenStack services always need uh, a, uh, an AMQP service. They basically need at least one RabbitMQ that they can talk to. Um, but the uh, messages that are being put on the message bus they're essentially volatile and all of the OpenStack services are expected to resend them if they're not processed in time. So therefore, um, as long as you're not bottlenecking on your RabbitMQ itself, on your RabbitMQ throughput itself, it's generally fine to just have multiple RabbitMQ instances, one virtual IP that you flip around from one to another if necessary, and then in fact, everyone just talks to one of them and you have an, a, um, a high, availability, high availability manager that flips over the virtual IP, which works really, really fast. Only if you're actually uh, bottlenecking on the throughput of your message bus, 
then you should actually worry about uh, the replication of your queues themselves. So again, and then, then it becomes a little more complex, um, but um, generally that's relatively straightforward as well. When we talk about API endpoint load balancing, uh, so that is to say the load balancing of your RESTful HTTP, HTTPS services that your OpenStack APIs expose, again, there's a, a very clear winner, at least for the time being, and that's HAProxy. Every vendor basically does this kind of load balancing with HAProxy. Um, this wouldn't be the only uh, available option that we have in the open source community. There are several others. Um, there's currently no real reason to move off of HAProxy, but I assume there will be at some point as OpenStack clouds grow bigger and bigger because HAProxy is what it says on the tin. It's a proxy. That means that requests actually go through it back and forth through this proxy. And eventually what's going to happen in really, really massive OpenStack clouds is that uh, HAProxy is going to become a bottleneck. And then there's other options that I'm guessing we'll see emerging. So for example, L Director D is uh, with LVS uh, can do this in a slightly more efficient manner. Uh, you could arguably also push this off to the clients altogether by using uh, host names and DNS round robin, which then uh, requires that you do some uh, dynamic DNS zone management. But for the time being, it's, a pro it's HA proxy, it's what everyone uses, and it's fine and it works. When we talk about HA service management, yes, it is absolutely core sync and pacemaker that finally everyone has understood that they should be using. Um, this uh, stack is uh, the default high availability stack in uh, the uh, in, in Linux and in open source, and it has been for like a decade. Um, it has one major issue, and th that major issue has never been stability or reliability or fencing or anything like that. And the major issue with Pacemaker has always been usability. It's been hard to get right. It's been hard to configure right in such a way that um, things will not break uh, at you know the most inconvenient time. Um, and uh, this is something that all of the vendors have, uh, have basically solved by completely automating this pacemaker configuration. In other words, you will only be interacting with this thing uh, if you're a cloud operator by basically checking its status. And you're never going to be able to, uh, you, you're never going to need to configure it anymore. That was actually Freudian, sorry. Um, but you're never going to need to configure this actually manually, but the deployment facility will do that for you. And as far as cluster storage is concerned, um, we're, we're, we're seeing a very clear contender here. Uh, pretty much every uh, vendor under the sun, again with one exception, uh, supports Ceph as, uh, as, a, as a storage backend. Um, of course, there's also support for uh, like legacy SAN environments and things like that. But um, when it comes to distributed software-defined storage that is inherently reliable, that's inherently highly available, Ceph is, for most vendors and for most users, the way to go. Now I want to talk about deployment automation, and because this is the way that um, OpenStack vendors typically, and I'm not affiliated with either vendor, so I can basically speak my mind freely here on, on all of these. Uh, deployment automation is how vendors actually differentiate from each other. It's a major differentiator uh, of, from, that vendors use to distinguish their OpenStack product from the OpenStack product of the competition. And, and, and that's sort of a, uh, a clearly defined uh, a boundary there. Uh, and uh, vendors basically prefer um, certain deployment automation facilities. Uh, Red Hat and Mirantis both prefer uh, ultimately Puppet, although they use different management facilities to manage Puppet. Um, SUSE prefers, uh, uh, prefers uh, Chef through Crowbar. Ubuntu uh, prefers Juju. But um, this is an important, uh, an important aspect to consider here for, uh, for, for high availability. So what does the set aforementioned vendor support for OpenStack HA look like? Uh, and I want to go through some of the, uh, some of the major uh, vendors here. Um, and, uh, and in rehearsing this talk, I, I found out that I only have time for four. Um, and uh, I'll have to leave all the others aside. But I think those four are sort of the, 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 the most important ones. And I'm, I'm starting, I, or I'm, I'm doing this in completely random order. I'm certainly not doing it in order of quality or in, in order of my personal endorsement of it or anything like that. Uh, I'm just doing it in completely random order. Um, and I'm starting out with um, what we've already seen here in the previous talk, if you were in this room uh, uh, previously, and that's the HA solution that we have in, uh, in Mirantis OpenStack, which is based on, or which is deployed with uh, their fuel deployment facility, which in turn is based on Puppet or uses Puppet heavily. 
Um, and I have a, a, a slide here that is pulled straight from the Mirantis documentation. Um, and I put it up here because it's relatively indicative of what everyone else uses as well, except that, of course, if you talk to uh, people from these individual vendors, they will obviously tell you, well, we're doing it better than someone else. Uh, but generally speaking, this is sort of the general arrangement that you have. You have more than one, and this is just about, just talking about control nodes because that's sort of where most of the action happens. Um, so you've got control nodes, more than one, Mirantis supports two, there's other vendors that basically say you will have to deploy three or we're not taking you seriously. Um, and on those controller nodes, we have a chorusing pacemaker cluster that then manages the rest of the services. And some of these services that are being managed are, for example, the Neutron Agents, uh, MySQL, Galera, the various API services, also RabbitMQ. And then uh, another important service that's being managed is HAProxy. And there is a, a, a public and external IP address, that's the E over here, um, that is, uh, again, in turn, managed by Pacemaker that HAProxy can then bind to. So you've got all these backend services that are configured as backends to HAProxy, and HAProxy itself uh, basically shifts the VIP around, shifts the, the, the virtual IP of, of, of HA proxy around. Um, and, uh, and that's essentially it. So that's sort of at the core of what every other vendor is doing uh, as well. So that's sort of the Mirantis approach. And this is from the Mirantis 5.1 uh, documentation. If there's any Mirantis guys in the rooms and you want to chide me for using something that is newer, then please point me to that and I'll be happy to update the slides. Uh, next up, I want to talk about uh, Ubuntu. Now for Ubuntu, the, the default or the preferred deployment facility is of course Juju, uh, and uh, their uh, bare metal deployment service uh, is called Maz. And uh, the, um, again, this is a slide that's pulled directly from the Ubuntu documentation. So what you have here is you've got the, the admin or deployment nodes that run uh, Maz and Juju. And then you have a controller node of which you typically have three instances, so a three node cluster. Um, this they call the Nova Cloud Controller that runs all these API services, uh, which can optionally also uh, act as a Ceph a Rados gateway and also runs the OpenStack dashboard. Um, you have something that in their Juju Charms names, they still call uh, the Quantum Gateway. For some reason, they, they never renamed the Charm, uh, but that's the thing that basically acts as your Neutron Network node. Um, then you've got RabbitMQ and MySQL, and you can also use uh, Juju, obviously, to deploy uh, Ceph nodes and compute nodes. And what's kind of nice about Juju is the fact that it distinguishes between what it calls a service and a relation. And the idea is that you can essentially deploy a service anywhere in the cluster, and only when you define a relation between one service and another do they actually reconfigure themselves automatically to talk to each other. So for example, you would deploy MySQL anywhere in your cluster. You would deploy um, RabbitMQ anywhere in your cluster. Uh, and uh, you would deploy uh, Ceph somewhere in your cluster. And then you only define a relation, and you also deploy Glance, and then you only define a relation from Glance to all others, and, uh, and that's how they actually uh, can, can talk to each other. Uh, what's not in this slide, because I guess the Ubuntu product managers don't con uh, consider it super important, is the fact that yes, this too uses Pacemaker. Yes, this too... Um, deploys uh, and configures Pacemaker automatically. And the way they do this is, in my humble opinion, it's kind of elegant, uh, which is uh, they basically define that if a service has a relation to its own service type, then that means it's a cluster. Simple as that. Um, so that's actually, I think that's, that's pretty cool. Next up, I want to talk about SUSE Cloud. Uh, for those of you who were in the tutorial that uh, myself and intrepid cellist turned SUSE engineer Adam Spires did on uh, Monday, this will not be news to you. So SUSE Cloud is based on uh, Crowbar. And this again is a page from the, or a slide from the SUSE documentation. By now you will see a pattern emerging here. Again, we have an admin node or a control node, which in SUSE's case is running Crowbar, uh, is running a chef server, can potentially also act as a software mirror and runs a DHCP and TFTP service. So you can pixie boot your other bare metal nodes. Then you've got a control node, or ideally two, uh, which runs your database, your RabbitMQ uh, message queue, your OpenStack APIs, your dashboard, your schedulers, your keystone, your glance, and so forth. One thing that's 
somewhat special about SUSE is they're the only ones, they're, they're the only vendor that does not uh, concentrate on MySQL as their database backend. Instead, they favor Postgres. And for some reason or another, they're using DRBD for Postgres uh, database replication, which is a bit weird because it doesn't scale out uh, across two nodes. Um, and so I'm hoping that they're eventually going to add some, um, some Postgres 9.2 style uh, synchronous replication to that. And then, of course, uh, further on, you've got your compute nodes and you've got your storage nodes, compute nodes running Nova and, uh, and, and storage nodes uh, running Ceph. And then finally, um, the, uh, the, 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 I think the team that was latest to the party, but I'm not entirely sure, um, and that's uh, what we find in, in Red Hat. And as, as you're all well aware, those of you who are Red Hat customers or Red Hat or CentOS users, uh, for, 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 for Red Hat uh, products, there's always a kind of a cool and exciting name that all the, the, the developers use, and then there is something that product marketing comes up with. So in, in, in Red Hat's case, there is this thing that's called Stay Puffed, which is kind of cute, and then there's this other thing that's called the Red Hat Enterprise Linux OpenStack Platform. It's Star. Sorry. <laughs> um, so, uh, so this thing is, so Stay Puft is actually a Foreman plugin. So for those of you uh, uh, familiar with, with, with Foreman, that's essentially a, a deployment automation facility that adds an, a nice little GUI and some orchestration uh, to, to Puppet. And Stay Puft is a Foreman uh, plugin that you can use to, um, to deploy uh, Red Hat OpenStack or the Red Hat Enterprise Linux OpenStack platform. Um, and, and this is sort of, uh, their documentation gets credit for basically having the most detailed overview of this whole thing, but again, you will sort of see a pattern emerging here, although the, the admin node is actually out of the slide here, uh, so you would have a, um, an, an admin and deployment server that runs Foreman with Stay Puffed, and then you've got your pacemaker managed clustered load balancer, again, using HA proxy. Uh, Red Hat uses a uh, unique approach where they uh, actually set a separate virtual IP address. They configure a separate cluster of virtual IP address for every single man uh, service that they're managing, every single API service that they're managing. Um, and that has the added benefit that those can essentially fail over and recover uh, independently of all other services, which is kind of neat. Um, then you've got, again, pacemaker managed uh, services in an, an active active cluster configuration with your Horizon, your Glance, your Nova, and uh, this also uses uh, Galera for active-active uh, active database clustering. Um, this slide is a bit of a cop-out because it doesn't say which Galera it is, um, but uh, Red Hat seems to standardize on MariaDB cluster now. Generally, for all intents and purposes, it's gonna, be, it's gonna work exactly the same for you, no matter whether it's MySQL slash Galera or MariaDB cluster or Pocona XDB cluster. They all do the same thing. They do write-set replication in a master-master fashion for uh, for MySQL. And uh, another thing that is not in, uh, in, in RHEL OSP at this time is uh, support for Ceph. There is some support for GlustrFS, so you can achieve some of the same, um, for example, Nova backing and Cinder backing facility with, uh, with GlustrFS. But as of this time, uh, there is no support for Ceph in there. Considering they just dumped $175 million on the company that, uh, that makes it, I guess it's fair to assume that we're going to see that relatively <laughs> soon. Mm -hmm. uh, and again, uh, the, the, the Red Hat documentation also says that uh, if you're not deploying three nodes at least, we're not taking you seriously, which is entirely reasonable. In, in, an, in an HA configuration because then you can actually get decent quorum, you can implement fencing properly and, and so forth. Um, this is important. I, I, work, I work with a lot of customers and I frequently get the question of, well, why can't we just forego everything the vendor does for us and just deploy OpenStack packages and configure them manually? You do not want to do that, really. You don't want to do that. And I want to show you something here. Uh, let me do this here real quick. Um, this is going to take a few seconds uh, to, to load, uh, provided the Wi-Fi is not failing us here. Um, so what you're going to see here, hopefully, in a little bit, is uh, you're going to see a puppet run uh, of a configuration uh, that is uh, that is being applied to a highly available pacemaker control node, and um, 
It's quite possible that, um, that, the, that the Wi-Fi is basically saying, hell no, Florian, I'm not going to allow you to do that. But I gave you the slides at the top of the talk. The QR code that you saw at the top of the talk is, the, is a direct link to the slides. Uh, and you can totally replay this uh, by yourself. Let me just reload this really quickly here and see if that helps. Because if it does, then that would be great. And if it's not, then I'm going to chalk that up to the Wi-Fi. Uh, and I do apologize for that. But what you're going to see here uh, when, you, when you actually look at this sort of from the comf comfort of your home or office or hotel room or w whatever you'd like uh, is this thing actually runs, it runs for about uh, three minutes. Uh, and it uh, produces, I think, about something like 7,000 lines of, of debug code. Uh, now, the debug code itself doesn't do a whole lot except basically it's, it's puppet checking for things that are happening or checking for things that are, that are configured or, or not configured. But the point is, if you're trying to do this manually, then you're going to have to make all these checks manually. And uh, it's about 50 different configuration options that are being set. Uh, and like I said, it takes about uh, three minutes to run. Um, and this thing runs at double speed, and the kicker is that's a no-op. So that's after having configured the whole thing and then just run Puppet again. Um, and it just not doing anything is just working for like three minutes. So that's, please, don't try this at home. Don't, don't do this manually. Uh, whatever you want to do, uh, we, we generally recommend to people uh, use a deployment facility that your vendor makes available to you. Just use that. If you want to build a heterogeneous cloud, uh, meaning you want to not put all your eggs in one basket, which is entirely reasonable, and you want to support more than one uh, OpenStack vendor in your, in your private or public cloud, which also is perfectly reasonable, then build separate OpenStack regions, which basically means that you have separate OpenStack clouds that are backed by a different set of uh, technology, and then um, federate them, and that's it. That's how you do that. Okay, so let's move on here, because, uh, oh, at, now you're arriving. There's Adam, and I'm sure he didn't bring his, his, his sacrificial chicken, uh, which totally explains, oh, you've got the chicken. Well, now it's too late. You know, this is not going to work. Um, okay, and, and then again, we have, a, we have another one of those. Let me try that. Maybe that works. Um, there we go, that's much better. And this is, this is basically a CRM mon failover. Uh, this is on a Red Hat platform. You see all the different uh, IP addresses here for the various uh, services. What we're going to see in a moment is uh, one of those nodes failing. Uh, and then uh, essentially an automatic uh, failover happening. So there, boom, that node is offline. It has now been fenced. Uh, all the services fail over and uh, within about 30 seconds we're back in business um, and that's it. So this is actually really nice and, and, and reliable um, HA uh, configuration there, something that you can actually use. Um, and here is the, there we go, hang on. That's it. And this is the same thing on SUSE. Like I said, a slightly different approach where you have got the, uh, where there's a single IP address, a single VIP for all of the API services and another one for the database and another one for, um, for AMQP. Again, same thing, node failing, node is unclean now, is being fenced and then we have, uh, we see failover and that whole thing uh, basically completes inside of 30 seconds uh, and, and everything is fine and wonderful again. So this is something where we can actually talk about, yes, um, I, I call that HA. Um, that's actually pretty cool. Um, okay, so. Not everything is cinnamon rolls and sunshine in HA, in OpenStack, as yet. Admit it, you're surprised. Um, so what are the open issues that we still have uh, in, in OpenStack? Uh, so a classic, uh, a, a classic pain point that we've had for a long time uh, in, in OpenStack HA were the Neutron L3 agents. Uh, because, as I mentioned previously, a Neutron L3 agent basically maintains all of our virtual routers, uh, and so it is uh, responsible not only for uh, upstream routing or north-south routing as we call it, but also for east-west routing. And finally, if you don't have a working router, then uh, if you're working with Neutron and the Nova Metadata uh, API proxy, then you're also not going to be able to fire up new VMs because your cloud init is just going to go nowhere. So we want this thing to be highly available, um, but we also don't want it to be a bottleneck because we, if we have only one of them, uh, which basically means active-passive high availability, then, uh, well, we can make sure that we always have L3 agents and their routers available, but they might still be overwhelmed with the, with the traffic that's passing through them. So that doesn't work too well. 
So instead, what we want for the L3 agents is active-active uh, high availability. And uh, there we got something back in Grizzly, which at the time was called the quantum scheduler and is now called the neutron scheduler. Uh, so what this does is that it allows us to have uh, multiple instances of the neutron L3 agent. Prior to the advent of the neutron scheduler, we could only ever have one. With the neutron scheduler, we can have several. And then as we create a new, um, a new virtual router, uh, we can either uh, have Neutron randomly assign it to one of the existing L3 agents, but we can also manually shift it to, uh, to a different agent. Uh, the problem with that is this thing knows nothing about, at least up until uh, Icehouse, knew nothing about whether that other agent um, that is also hosting routers is actually still alive. And the assignment of virtual routers to L3 agents was static. So what you would have to do if one of the nodes, uh, if one of your network nodes went down, you would have to basically manually go in, have some administrator intervention, enumerate those, uh, those virtual routers that were assigned to the agent that had just gone down, and reassign them, which is LA, low availability. Um, not something that you would typically uh, want to have. The first way of, uh, the, the, the first fix that we, that we had for that uh, was uh, already available pre-Juno. It actually came out of SUSE. Uh, it was a thing called NeutronHATool.py, and what it did is it basically, uh, when invoked, uh, it would use the Neutron Python API to enumerate those routers and automatically uh, switch them over to another. And that would then be invoked from the uh, SUSE HA infrastructure. So from within the pacemaker cluster with notifications, this would be, uh, this would be enabled, and then we would shift those over. Um, which worked, but was, I mean, this is functionality that kind of should be in, uh, in OpenStack itself. So now in Juno, we have uh, automatic agent rescheduling. This was already mentioned in the previous task. This is the, um, the configuration option that you need to set for it. Problem with that is, uh, agent down detection isn't exactly fast in Neutron. So um, this mean beca because Neutron itself doesn't use anything like Pacemaker or whatever, so it has to be much dumber about uh, essentially uh, doing agent down detection. So this can take a really, really long time, really, really long time, like it could still be on the inside, well on the inside of one minute, but that's something that your users might still hate. Uh, and then uh, what happens is the router is simply being kicked back to the, uh, the virtual router is simply being kicked back to the neutron scheduler and is being rescheduled on an agent that is still alive. So uh, this is in Juno, it works, but it's slow. Then we have something that I, when I first read about it, uh, I thought it was really, really cool, and that is HA virtual routers. That is the ability to have more than one L3 agent, and then uh, just identifying a virtual router as, as highly available. The way this works is uh, in, on, the, uh, on the network nodes, inside the appropriate Q router namespaces, we effectively have keep alive D running. Uh, and uh, keep alive D makes sure that the inside uh, IP address, the inside gateway IP address of that virtual router um, is, is kept available with VRP. And that's really kind of cool because now if uh, one of your uh, agent instances dies, uh, then the other node can simply fail over using keep alive D, VRP, and whatnot, and you're not even losing a ping, so you can literally ping through the failure. Um, the problem with that is that as of now, at least, um, this does not replicate connection state. So um, including a contract D in this, in this solution simply didn't make it uh, into Juno. Um, and so therefore, while you're not going to be losing a ping, you will have to reinitiate anything that's, for example, a TCP connection. Um, and then we have another thing that's called distributed virtual routers, or DVRs, uh, also brand new in Juno, also marked experimental for this release and expected to be fully supported in Kilo. Um, and this is the Neutron equivalent to Nova Network Multi-Host, where you're actually running router instances on your compute nodes. This requires a change to your network topology because your compute nodes now need to be connected to your external network. Uh, it only, as of now, works for... Um, virtual machines that actually have floating IP uh, address, addresses assigned. It doesn't work with the default SNAT. That still goes through the, uh, through the regular uh, network node, the, the basically fallback um, L3 agent on a network node. And unfortunately, um, this is a bit of a downer. Right now, we can't combine for a single virtual router DVR and HA. So sadly, as, at least as of Juno, you can basically pick and choose whether you want to do away with your single point of failure there or with your bottleneck 
but you can't kill both at the same time. And we're hoping for that to improve um, for, for Kilo. <coughs> so that was all the opening issues in Neutron. Um, and then there's this other thing, which I consider sort of the holy grail. I would love for OpenStack to be able to do Nova boot dash dash HA, or Nova boot dash dash keep me running and don't bother me again. Um, and and there's, there's, been, there's been a lot of discussion up about this topic over the last two years. It has repeatedly been rejected because uh, people basically said, well, this shouldn't be in Nova. Um, as of about three weeks ago, we have a really, really nice proposal from ex-Nova PTL, uh, Russell Bryant, uh, with, uh, which involves, again, using Pacemaker and using Pacemaker Remote for uh, virtual machine high availability. There was a design summit session on this on Monday, and uh, I'm really, really hoping that we're going to see that in uh, either Kilo uh, or, uh, or, or, or a subsequent release. You can, st you can already build highly available virtual machines using kind of kludges and crutches, but it's not very elegant. Um, but this will sort of be the, the, the last thing um, that we are still waiting for. <laughs> I am almost out of time. Uh, I will let you know that if you um, want, and the almost there was not about me being almost out, out of time, but the almost there was about, we're almost there in terms of, uh, of high availability. Recall what I said about kids and road trips earlier. And recall how often you have told your kids we're almost there, um, and under what circumstances. Uh, but it's 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 looking a lot better, a lot 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 better than it did two and a half years ago. You can build, you can already build a highly available OpenStack cloud uh, with. There's some things that you should be aware of, and please don't try to do it manually. Before I get to your questions, two things. One, if you would like to reuse this sli these slides for whatever you'd like, uh, all of my slides are under CC by SA. Uh, this is the link, and uh, feel free to share those, copy those, adapt those, and remix those. And finally, one shameless plug. Uh, my company, Hestexo, actually does uh, OpenStack training, among many other things, and uh, this will get you to a link on our website uh, that will let you know how to score a 15% 50 discount on the trainings that we have from now until the end of the year. If, of course, you're already here, so you already don't need that anymore because you're all experts, but maybe you have a friend back home at the office that couldn't come, let them know, um, and we'll be happy to help them out. And with that, I think I'm actually nominally over time, but I guess I can take one or two questions, and then I'll take all other questions outside in the hallway. Or is everyone already rushing to get to the next session? And that's perfectly fine too, if that's the case. Thank you very much for your attention. Enjoy the rest of the conference. Have a great week. Thank you.